Policy Committee. Uh, today is Thursday, March 11th, 2021, uh, and we are uh, conducting our uh, committee hearing this afternoon via Zoom. Uh, we do have a uh, quorum and we are going to get started. Uh, before we get started with today's agenda, just a quick note uh, to help you out for next week. Uh, we are anticipating that we will hold a hearing on uh, MnDOT's budget on Tuesday and that we will do the Met Council and DPS budget on Thursday. Uh, we have uh, four bills on the agenda for this afternoon. Uh, the first bill is uh, Senator Desick's bill, uh, Senate file 1641. Senator Desick, nice to see you. Welcome to the committee. Um, uh, please proceed with your bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, members. Thank you for hearing this bill. Um, this is Senate File 1641. This is a bill amending driver's license expiration and renewal timeframe for people serving in the Peace Corps. This bill came to me from a constituent who was serving in the Peace Corps. Um, some of you may have been on the committee two years ago. We heard it then. Um, there's an application process to, you re to renew your license by mail if you are temporarily not living in Minnesota. It's used by many snowbirds. I think they use similar um, processes due, you know, due to COVID this year where they were a little more flexible. Uh, you fill out an application, you get it when you're a snowbird, you fill out an application, you get a vis visit vision exam, and then you get doc documents notarized, and then you return them to driver and vehicle services. And then they will use your current picture. You can do this, um, they call it an exemption once, and then you have to actually renew in person four years later. Um, the, my constituent attempted this process, but he was in remote Thailand serving in the Peace Corps, so he was not able to find a vision doctor. Finding eye doctors in remote Thailand was hard. And then it was a more than one day's trip um, to maybe go to Bangkok, find a doctor, find out if they could actually fill out the form and certify what DVS needed. And then he had to make an appointment with the embassy in Bangkok to get it certified. So that was um, a lot of rigmarole. And when he was preparing to go to the Peace Corps, they had a checklist and everything. They were going to go for about two years, two years plus. Um, and they didn't think to, you know, check when did the driver's license renewal. And so when they were over there, they were offered an extension and they were debating it. And then they saw that their driver's license, you know, was going to expire. And so that's when they kind of attempted to go through the process. And then in the end, it didn't work out. And so they had to come home. And so uh, my constituent kept... Um, kept on it and he talked to the Peace Corps and then um, dug into this a little more and then suggested that maybe we allow some type of waiver for those that are serving in the Peace Corps. Uh, we do have a um, an exception for active military members. There are about 562 active military members right now who are not living in Minnesota. They might be stationed someplace in the country or overseas. And so they are able to get an exception so they um, fill out different forms. They get uh, um, they fill out forms, and then they have their superior send in some you know a DVS form, and it has to be signed by their first uh, superior officer. And then they tell them when they're you know when they're heading back. And then when they get back, they have a specific time frame when they have to go on and renew it. There is some you know they in big bold print, it says that, you know, not this this kind of quote expired license, but they have the waiver, might not, you know, be viewed as valid in some other states. And so when they come back to the states, if they're, or if they're stationed in another state, that might be a problem. But, um, you know, they have this process set up and everybody understands that. So looking into it, we thought we could maybe do a similar process with the Peace Corps. Um, I called the Peace Corps to attempt to figuring they have to have a government relations person to attempt to find out what other states do, um, if anybody else running into that and how many active members they potentially have from Minnesota to find out how many people this would impact. Um, unfortunately, after several attempts, I still have not gotten a return phone call. I'm sure it's not high on their priority, um, but I did look into that, but I don't think it would be that many people that would be um, looking into this, so I don't think it would be that much of a burden on uh, DVS or um, MnDOT because it's just a few people they would um, 
you know, they could, this is what the, we have the form, if we were in person, we could show it that, you know, uh, Department of Vehicle Services could set up an actual form that they have to fill out similar to what the people in the military do, and then, um, you know, get it on there with their, um, I don't know if it's their, you know, superior, but it's a person that is in charge of the country or that is in charge of the region of where they're at. They are issued a Peace Corps driver's license. And so similar to the military, they could, you know, photocopy a copy of their driver's license or their ID that shows that they're in the Peace Corps, put it on Peace Corps letterhead, fill out the form and um, get it notarized and sent back. So it's just a, it is just a suggestion. The, um, uh, Peace Corps has volunteers that work creatively to solve critical challenges alongside community leaders in 141 countries. They've been around for the last four decades. We have several laws encouraging people to volunteer and to donate. And this is another way to get people to volunteer and to support that service. So um, it's kind of one of those simple, just random bills that comes from your constituents, but uh, it you know would have helped them because they would have stayed longer and continued some service over in Thailand, but um, unfortunately had to come back and they came back before COVID uh, because of they ran into the driver's license timeframe problem. So would just like to, um, with that, be available to answer your questions. And then I believe Amanda Hemmingson Yeager with Department of Vehicle Services is also here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dizek. Uh, I will go to your, for your testifier then. Is this a testifier that you have online or uh, just someone to answer questions? Um, um, thank you, Chair Newman. It is just the um, uh, Department of Vehicle Services person to answer the question. My constituent is off in remote Mexico right now teaching English. Okay. And so, you know, we were gonna try to get, since we're virtual, we were gonna try to get him hooked up here to testify, but that did not work. No problem, no problem. I want to. Um, <laughs> uh, members, uh, do you have any questions of either Senator Dietzik or uh, DVS? Uh, Senator Dibble. Not a question, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, just a question of you. Um, is this going to be laid over for possible inclusion or, or is it going to need a motion at some point? It will be laid over, Senator Dibble. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I should say I'm supportive. I think it's a good idea. It uh, just kind of mirrors what we do for military personnel and um, a small number of people. So it seems to make sense. Thank you, Senator Dibble. I, I too think that it is a, a, a good idea uh, and I uh, support what Senator Dietzik uh, is trying to accomplish here. Uh, any other uh, questions from any members? I am not seeing any, Senator Dietzik. Any final words before we lay your bill over? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Um, I'm not trying to compare the Peace Corps members to the uh, military, active military. I think that lots of times active military, they, you know, they are in dangerous places, but Peace Corps sometimes are also in dangerous places. And yeah, I'm not trying to compare them, just trying to, sometimes they are in remote areas. And if we can make it easier for both of them, both military members and, and Peace Corps members to continue their service and um, still be um, you know, Minnesota constituent and Minnesota resident, I think that's a great thing. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator Dietzik. And with that, uh, members, Senate file uh, 1641 is laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, the next bill that we are going to take up is Senator Jasinski's bill, uh, Senate file 1399. Uh, and I understand, Senator Jasinski, that you have a, uh, a uh, an author's amendment. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, that is correct. I would uh, have the A2 as a technical correction uh, to my bill. I would put it in order uh, for today's reading. Hearing, sorry. Members, uh, uh, are, and I assume, Senator Jasinski, you are moving the A2 at this point. Yes, I move the A2 amendment, please. Members, all those in favor of uh, Senator Jasinski's uh, author's amendment of the A2, uh, if you would uh, turn on your cameras on mute. All those in favor, please say aye and give me a thumbs up, please. Aye. aye. Those opposed, no, and a thumbs down. The motion passes. The amendment is adopted. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, I don't know if you previously remember the 
uh, last year, I believe it was, Senator Housley did a bill uh, for online driver's testing. Uh, after thinking about this and hearing some stories about it, I thought I'd add some language that would tighten up the testing, uh, the proctor language of who could proctor this test. Uh, I was concerned that uh, this test was not being properly uh, proctored and there could be some potential, uh, I would say cheating going on to take this test. Uh, so what I put forward uh, with the department and uh, with our Senate staff is some language that would tighten the bill up and make the proctor a little bit more uh, uh, defined on who can do it to, to make sure that uh, family members and things like that can't be proctoring their own students or their own children's tests or older siblings and things like that. I just think it tightens it up. Uh, with that, I'd ask Ms. Stengel to go through and clarify the new language and, and how it addresses the issue. Ms. Stengel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, the new language in the amendment starts on line 1.26, and it specifies who a proctor must be. Um, the first clause is similar to the underlying bill, an employer of the driver ed program authorized entity or state, state or local government. Line 1.30 is new language from the in the amendment and that authorizes a driver's license agent to proctor. And lines 2.1 and 2.2 are also um, a modification of the bills introduced. This specifies that it's a classroom teacher, school administrator, or paraprofessional at a public or private school, excluding a home school. And the difference here is in the underlying bill, um, the way schools were listed, it didn't comprehensively cover all of the schools uh, that the Senator wanted to include, and it included all uh, anybody employed uh, by a school. So this sort of limits it to the teachers, administrators, and paraprofessionals. And then the other change from the bill as introduced is the effective date. Uh, the effective date is now August 1st, 2021, or after the peacetime emergency is over. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Um, and Senator Jasinski, I, I do not see any testifiers. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chair. This was just uh, my idea to uh, uh, tighten up the language, so I have no testifiers today. Uh, members, do you have any questions on Senator Jasinski's bill? I am not seeing any, Senator Jasinski. Uh, this bill members uh, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Final word, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members, for considering this uh, bill before you. Again, I think this just uh, puts a little bit more clout into uh, taking the tests online, uh, make sure there's uh, nothing fraudulent being happened, and uh, just, just uh, will improve the process. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Jasinski. With that, uh, uh, Senate File 1399, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. The next bill on the agenda is Senator Johnson's bill, uh, Senate 1423. Are you here, Senator Johnson? There I you are. I am here, Mr. Welcome, Chair. Welcome, Senator Johnson. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you I for your you've got one testifier, so why don't you proceed with your bill, Senator Johnson, then we'll go to your testifier. You bet. Thank, thank you, Senator Newman. But well, we've we've heard the old saying that everything's been said, but not everybody said it. I think that's kind of the way with this bill. We actually voted last year on this particular bill uh, on the Senate floor, and it passed 67 to 0. However, we do have some new members, so they'd probably like some votes on this as well. So we'll uh, take it up again and try it one more time. But uh, Senate File 1423 uh, allows owners of manufactured homes to attach those homes to the uh, real property in a communal living uh, park, a community living park. So they have a real interest in the property. And it allows for uh, financing. And it's not chattel, because that's what they currently have to finance these homes as, which you can imagine if you're financing uh, your manufactured home in the same way you do a car or a motorcycle or something like that, you're going to have shorter terms, higher interest rate, more expensive loan payment each month. But now they can use this as a mortgaged uh, piece of, uh, of, of real property, an improvement to real property, which allows for lower interest rates, longer terms, allows those payments to be more affordable. I'll end there, um, Mr. Chair, if you can go to uh, Ms. Clark, and she can cover the bases uh, at this point. 
Happy to do that, Senator Johnson. I will tell you, uh, yes, this bill looks familiar, uh, as did Senator Rood's bill the other day, something about uh, <laughs> mobile homes and mobile parks that keep coming well, back. Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I think the, the importance of these items are that they're small tools that, that can be used, but when we hear about workforce housing uh, as being a real constraint for some of our communities, that you know, anytime we get an opportunity to to open up some of some available housing, I think we're very anxious to do that. So uh, that's just my my notes on that. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Uh, Ms. Clark, welcome to the committee. Please state your name, uh, with whom you are associated, and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Victoria Clark. Um, I am the executive director at North Country Cooperative Foundation or NCF. NCF works with nine cooperatively owned manufactured home communities across the state, representing a little over 700 um, homeowners in, in Minnesota. We've been involved in this sector, helping residents convert their communities to cooperative ownership and supporting them um, in perpetuity as co-op owners since 2004. We've learned a lot about the challenges facing owners of manufactured home communities over the years, and chief among them um, is the challenges uh, uh, posed by increasing physical vacancy rates across our co-ops. I mentioned that we serve a little over 700 homes uh, uh, through our co-op conversion program, and about 100 sites of those 700 are currently vacant, and these vacancies equate to over 400000 in annual loss revenue across our portfolio of client co-ops. This increasing home vacancy is due to uh, homes that due to their age and condition, homes that predate the institution of the 1976 Manufactured Home Building Code um, are not good candidates for rehab. Uh, these homes due to their design um, and, and how old they are, aren't good candidates uh, for rehabilitation. And so what we usually end up seeing is that these um, these homes get uh, removed from the community or demolished on site. Uh, we did. We recently surveyed our client co-ops to understand a little bit better about how many of these pre-1976 homes that aren't good candidates for rehab actually exist across the home stock in our client co-ops. And about 30% of all the homes are these pre-1976 homes. So we're expecting more of these homes to, um, uh, to, to be demolished over the years. And uh, the challenge to getting these home sites uh, filled with a new home after they've gone vacant really uh, is the primary challenge to filling these sites is for uh, all the reasons that uh, Senator uh, Johnson mentioned and they it relates to how these homes are titled. So they're titled as personal property, uh, which means that they're uh, uh, relegated to the world of what we call chattel finance. And chattel lenders are increasingly few and far between. Uh, there's less actors out there um, and they come with uh, uh, about uh, uh, loan terms that are significantly um, less attractive and, and make these loans unaffordable. Uh, just as a point of comparison, I've never seen a chattel loan that goes beyond 20 years in, for a term. Uh, most of them are 10, uh, 10 year terms and uh, the interest rates on chattel loans are, you know, upwards of 5%. And if your credit score has any amount of fuzz on it, which is the case for uh, uh, quite a few of the folks that are applying uh, to purchase new homes and place them in our client co-ops, these loan terms get uh, even more unaffordable. They get shorter and interest rates get higher. Uh, and we're serving very deeply. Um, we're se they're serving uh, very low-income households. We're overwhelmingly serving households at or below 50% area median income. About a third of the households that we serve are 30% area median income and below. Um, so what we wanna do is create loan products that can reach these uh, lower income uh, Minnesotans. And that's exactly what this uh, bill is designed to do. Title reform would allow us to open up um, new financing uh, products and, and make more uh, homes available uh, to uh, low income Minnesotans in our state. And it would be a double win uh, because uh, passing this type of uh, legislation will help us revitalize the housing stock in our co-ops. So we're placing those older units with new homes um, and at price points that are deeply affordable. Uh, so thanks so much for uh, hearing this bill. I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Senator Osmick. Uh, thank you. Question for the chair. If you're if you're taking all the mobile home bills, I have a mobile home bill for property taxes in the property tax division. If you'd like that one, I can have it re-referred to you. You could uh, always talk to me offline, Senator Osmick. <laughs> any, uh, any other questions by other members? Senator Howell. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, you know, it, and maybe you covered this, maybe I missed it, but when I, I, I know there's some folks out there in, in my district that have contacted me that turned and surrendered their certificate of title 20 years ago when they purchased the property and it became part of the part of the uh, real property. But now they've tried to refinance and the refinancing company wants that certificate or the surrender stuff. And they it's 20 years ago, they don't have it. Uh, and it seems like they are struggling to try and get that uh, a copy of it from the state. It, it's, I don't know what the case is, but they can't seem to get it to refinance their property. Will this bill make that an easier process for them? Um, Ms. Clark, Senator Johnson. Uh, I would, you know, this doesn't deal with that certificate uh, in that way that I'm aware of, but if Ms. Clark has some more details, I, I think that's slightly off the, the topic of this bill here as far as what it what it functionally does. Um, Ms. Clark, can you, you know, answer uh, Senator Howe's question? Sure, I can, I can, I can try, you know, part of there's overlap between this bill and uh, Senator Rudes and uh, my understanding of when this, when the bill language was drafted initially, uh, there was collaboration with the Minnesota land title and the real property division of the state bar association. And so part the, 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 the first few pages of this bill are all related to um, uh, assuring that the recording process is, is improved. Um, and that affidavits are filed. Um, and, and so I can imagine that that would improve the, the historical records of this, of, of when you affix the property um, uh, and surrender the title. Um, I, would, I would defer to um, uh, Senate staff or council on, on whether it would solve that specific issue, Senator Howe. Um, but I do know that substantial changes to how the titles themselves are surrendered and then how the property is, is then affixed and titled as real. Um, several, a lot of that has been sorted out in the, the first part of this bill and, and Senator Roots, to my knowledge. Senator Howell, um, uh, this, this is now the, the second bill involving uh, mobile homes and you've had this question. Uh, only suggestion I could have is it doesn't really sound to me like you've received a real sound answer to your question. So it it may be yet another bill that we'll have to entertain uh, uh, don't, sometime in the future. Mr. Chair, don't pitch another bill idea to my to me. Well, yeah, I've got I think I've got plenty. <laughs> okay, just checking. Um, any other uh, members who want to raise a question or ask a question regarding? Uh, Senator Johnson's bill, and I do not see any hands popping up. Uh, Senator Johnson, uh, this bill uh, is to go on to uh, general orders from here. Any final words before we move your bill? No, Mr. Chair. Just want to thank you and the committee members for the opportunity to be here and, and Ms. Clark for your uh, insight into the bill. Appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Uh, Senator Coleman, would you uh, uh, be so kind as to move uh, Senate file uh, 1423 and place it on general orders, please? Uh, sure thing, Mr. Chair. I move that Senate file 1423 pass and be sent to general orders. Members, if you would unmute and uh, turn your cameras on. Uh, all those in favor of Senator Coleman's motion, please signify by saying aye and give me a hands up, please. Aye. 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 Those opposed, uh, no, and a thumbs down. The motion passes. Senator Johnson, you are on general orders. The final bill on the, uh, the schedule uh, today is Senate File 1513. And members, if you remember, we tabled this bill uh, to give us an opportunity uh, to, uh, to uh, work on a possible amendment. I think that that has now been accomplished. Uh, but before we can consider the bill, uh, I would, uh, maybe Senator Jasinski, I would entertain a motion uh, to take Senate File 1513 off the table. So moved, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, all those in favor of Senator Jasinski's motion, please signify by saying aye and give me a thumbs up, please. Aye. 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 
Those opposed, no, and a thumbs down. The motion passes. Senate file 1513 is now before the committee. Uh, Senator uh, uh, Dibble, um, uh, we do have the uh, A7 amendment uh, to your bill, um, which I believe is the amendment that uh, we have worked out Tell me what your pleasure is. Do you want me to move the A7 because it's a delete all or do you want to do it? Just give me an idea how you want to handle this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my preference would be for, for you to move it, um, but I'm happy to speak to it in support of it. That'd be just fine. Uh, given the fact that I am going to uh, uh, move the uh, A7, I will at this time pass the gavel to Senator uh, Jasinski and I will then uh, explain kind of where we are at. Uh, if you would take the gavel, please, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have the gavel, and uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you uh, to explain the amendment or the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, in the interim, uh, uh, we did work on uh, an amendment. Uh, ultimately, we came up with an, uh, an A6 amendment, uh, and then subsequent to that, uh, there was an A7, which is uh, an amendment that um, made some technical changes, I'm going to describe it as. Uh, but I think maybe the easiest thing for us to do would be to have Ms. Stengel go through the A7. And if you would, Ms. Stengel, uh, uh, when you get to that portion of the bill uh, where it changed from the A6 to the A7, if you would be able to point that out, uh, I would appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am just pulling up my notes on those changes so I don't miss anything. All right, uh, so going off of the A7 amendment, uh, which is a delete all, section one has to do with how, uh, how the program described in the bill will be paid. So a little bit later in the bill, there are some provisions for administrative citation revenue that will be collected. Um, if that fine revenue isn't sufficient to pay for um, the program and some of the safety monitoring requirements, Hennepin and Ramsey County will be required to submit payments to the council on an annual basis to sort of pay that excess amount. And there were a couple of changes to the A7 from the earlier version. Um, fixing up some of the cross references and making some uniformity throughout the language. Um, and you'll see the effective date is now August 1st. Um, in the earlier versions, the effective dates were sort of all over the place. The A7 sort of streamlines that and sets all of the effective dates for the sections with the exception of one section we'll get to later. Um, everything will be effective August 1st of this summer. Section two has to do with transit safety and requires the council to take a few different steps. Uh, this is the same from the A6 to the A7. The first part is that the council must adopt a rider code of conduct and post that at light rail transit stations and each park and ride. The council also has to establish and clearly designate paid fare zones at light rail stations uh, where there's a self-service ticket um, feature. And the third thing under this section requires the council to implement public safety monitoring and response activities um, at the light rail transit facilities. This includes things um, like a PA system and placement of security cameras um, to ensure that there's real time monitoring at all of the light rail transit stations. Section three has to do with staffing. Uh, this is the only section that's not effective August 1st. This one is effective immediately. And it requires the council to, um, or prohibits the council from reducing the number of Metro Transit police officers below the three year staffing average. Section four is the administrative citation program that's established. Uh, subdivision one sets forth some definitions, notably um, a transit agent, uh, which is a group of people that can either be a community service officer, a police officer, or the newly created uniform transit safety official. Subdivision two, starting on 2.27, requires the Met Council to implement this citation program. Uh, and as part of that, they have to consult with interested stakeholders. The 
council has to establish different policies and procedures to govern the implementation of this act, including um, the issuing of citations, contesting citations, um, and regulations for the uniform transit safety officials and uniforms um, that they have to wear while they're on duty. The council can also provide training to the uniform transit safety officials on a variety of topics, um, including things like crisis intervention, um, identifying people in need of social services, and um, different resources to refer people to. Subdivision 3 sets forth the uniform transit safety official duties, and these are the only duties the council cannot assign additional duties. And as you can see, there's a variety of things that they must do, including fair payment compliance inspection, issuing citations, um, monitoring and responding to passenger activity, providing information assistance um, and resources, and then where necessary, obtaining assistance from peace officers or other um, types of um, professional or other resources. And on the top of page four, you'll see that the uniform transit safety officials are required to be in uniform at all times when on duty. Subdivision four has to do with issuing citations. Um, and the citation, the administrative citation is for fare evasion only. So when somebody doesn't pay their transit fare, they can uh, be issued an administrative citation. And the options available to the transit agent sort of depend on who's issuing that citation. So a uniform transit safety official um, has to either issue a citation or a written warning. If they issue a written warning, it goes on, uh, it's recorded in the same manner as a citation. And um, that clarification of the, the written warning being recorded and reported only for the officials is a new feature of the A7 um, and narrows the scope a little bit. Um, a community service officer um, may issue a citation, a verbal or a written warning. And then a peace officer has sort of the most options for enforcement, including issuing an administrative citation, um, a criminal citation, a verbal or written warning. Uh, when the citation is issued, it must include the notice that the person can contest the citation and how to do that. The council cannot suggest a quota. Um, and if you are issued an administrative citation, you cannot also be issued a criminal citation. Section five talks about um, what to do when a person is issued a citation. Uh, they have 90 days to either pay or contest a citation. Uh, if they don't do either of those, then their uh, fine can go to collections. The council can also adopt an alternate, alternative resolution procedure, which allows a person to, instead of paying the fine, um, either perform community service or prepay future transit fares. Um, and this applies only to first time offenders or um, a person who demonstrates financial hardship. Um, going back to the idea of the appeal, the council has to provide a civil process um, for a person to contest the citation before a neutral third party. And then paragraph D on 5.4 requires the council to try to collect fines. And if they can't um, contract with somebody to um, do the collections for them. And then subdivision six on 514 sets the fine at no lower than $35, but the council can establish an escalating fine structure. Um, a person who's issued an administrative citation or written warning for a third or subsequent offense within 12 months of a previous offense is, is banned from transit services for 60 days. And then finally, subdivision seven, uh, says that the fines you, the fines collected can be used for the program and for the facility monitoring under the earlier section. And throughout the section, there were some changes um, to be consistent in language, usage, and uh, to fix some grammar things. And referring to um, uh, in the use of funds provision, it allows the council to use fines to pay for all aspects of the program instead of just the enforcement provisions. Section five, starting at the bottom of page five, requires an annual legislative report on the transit safety issues and the transit enforcement and administrative citation program. And there are a whole variety of things that the council has to report on, um, including policies adopted, some statistics and all those sorts of things. And then finally, there's section six, a mandatory ban. If somebody is convicted of a gross misdemeanor um, for, something, for a violation committed in a transit vehicle or a Met Council facility, 
um, they're banned from using transit for six months. If that violation is a felony, you are, the person is banned for one year from service, banned one year um, from transit services. Um, and I think that is um, an overview of the A7 and I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any questions about details. Mr. Thank Chair. you, Mr. Dingell. Uh, any questions from members before I know Senator Dibble wants to talk about the bill as well? Senator Newman, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I do. I just, before we go to Senator Dibble, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I just want members to understand that uh, this is sort of a compilation of my original A1 amendment, Senator Dibble's A2 amendment. Uh, we went to the A6 and, and then made some technical changes with the A7. Uh, the, the overall concept, at least as far as I am concerned, uh, is twofold. First of all, the civil uh, citation. Uh, what we're really talking about here is uh, uh, fair noncompliance. In other words, uh, if someone fails to, to, uh, to buy a ticket to get on the, uh, on the light rail, uh, it's, it's like a $2 ticket or something like that. So it's a very, fairly small uh, amount of money. And uh, because of the size of the uh, infraction, the value of the infraction, I guess I, I just came to the conclusion there's really nothing wrong with going from a criminal uh, citation to a civil citation. Once we get to the civil side of the things, um, uh, we have got a civil, pine, a civil fine, which in my mind, uh, opens the matter up for ADR, alternative dispute resolution. That's something that's very common in uh, civil matters as opposed to criminal. And it also provides for due process in the event uh, a citation is going to be contested. The other overall uh, thing that, that I felt was important uh, was to have someone on uh, the train in a uniform so that that person is easily identified as someone a passenger can talk to or contact and also would carry with it a certain air of responsibility and authority. So that is the person that we are calling the Uniform Transit Safety Official. Uh, the bill provides for specific duties for that particular individual. Uh, and uh, the bill also provides that these are additional uh, employees of Met Council and there would not be a reduction in the police force or the, the, the transit police. Uh, and I think that's important because what we're doing is we're trying to add some safety uh, to traveling on light rail. Uh, so I think it's important we don't reduce the availability of law enforcement, but at the same time, we're going to have someone on the uh, light rail that uh, can or has the ability to enforce the fair violation, but then also would have the ability to help people who may be in need, maybe they need directions, whatever the case might be. In my mind, it's pretty similar to having a conductor on, a, on an existing train. So those are my overall thoughts uh, uh, in uh, uh, in putting together the A7, uh, and I would at this point, Mr. Chairman, yield to Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Senator Newman. Senator Dibble, to your bill. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Senator Newman. Um, uh, so members um, will see a couple of uh, of the elements um, that I had proposed in my original bill, as well as um, what I had brought forward in the form of an amendment to my bill, the Transit Ambassadors Program. So you'll see, um, you'll see a few things um, that that um, continue on in this uh, delete everything amendment, um, uh, namely, um, you know, in terms of the, the the Transit Ambassador type idea, which I think is pretty important. Um, it's not named as such, but some of the duties of the of the uniform transit safety officials uh, would be very similar, or consistent with what we would imagine uh, transit ambassadors would be doing, helping people, identifying their needs, you know, adapting and de-escalating circumstances and situations and the like. Um, the uh, 
the administrative um, citations and penalties, escalating fine structure for uh, repeat and subsequent offenses rather than being specified as is, is more permissive uh, in the A7. Um, there is an inclusion of the, uh, the alternative resolution opportunity so that um, uh, in, in certain, you know, certain circumstances agreed to, um, you know, on both sides, uh, folks can resolve the, the um, fine or the fee or the sanction for failure to pay their fare in a different way. Um, again, the, the overarching goal of this whole idea um, is to make sure that we're both uh, ensuring consequences for failure to pay fines, but um, which paradoxically we don't achieve through the criminal citation process because those tend to get dismissed so frequently because the sanction is kind of disproportionate to the violation. Um, uh, and also uh, in those instances where it does stick, you're getting a lot of people further enmeshed in the criminal justice system and, and further pushing them to the margins and unable to resolve at the core are problems that they're presenting in many cases that need to be resolved in other ways than just making criminals out of them. Um, and then uh, uh, there's one other thing I was gonna call attention to. I should just mention for the record, and I, I think there are people here to testify there's not universal love. I don't universally love this draft. That's why it's a compromise. Um, Senator Newman doesn't love everything that he agreed to include in the A7. Um, so it's a compromise. Um, the counties in particular are um, not happy about section one and being on the hook um, to help pay for any shortfalls there might be in the program. Um, and I, I understand that. And. Um, and there are, uh, I think Josh Hodick is here from Sierra Club, so he can speak for himself. I think he's going to testify. But, um, you know, the fact that the criminal sanction even does still exist um, is something we definitely need to think about and consider, um, you know, that, you know, if we're going to get, if we're going to take this different approach, maybe we should uh, consider just getting rid of uh, fair evasion as a criminal offense altogether um, at some point in the not too distant future. So thank you. I would, uh, I support the A7 and I'm a Courage others to vote for it because I really want to move this forward. There's more process to be had. The House has a different idea, so there may be more conversation around the details, but um, I think it's important to, to continue this conversation and we can do that with this compromise amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Then with this, before we go to testify, Senator Newman, you move your A7 amendment? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Chairman. Would you like to move your A7 amendment at this time then? Uh, uh, yes, I would. Uh, I would move the A7. Senator Newman uh, moves the A7 amendment. Uh, all those in favor signify and uh, raise your thumb and say aye. 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 Those opposed say no and a thumbs down. Motion carries. The A7 is a, is a passed. And with that, we'll go to our testifiers. Uh, the first testifier I have is Mr. Story Chuantes. He is here. Hi, yeah, that's me. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Miss. I'm sorry, Miss. Sorry. No sorry worries. I'm, I'm I'm named after somebody who is <laughs> who uses he him. Um, um, please yeah, state your name and, and who you're with, and then proceed with your testimony for the record, please. Thank sure. you. Um, my name is Story Chuantes, and I am just I, I'm a resident of Minneapolis. Um, I want to thank you. Senators for having me here to testify about SF 1513. Um, I think this bill is a great start and I like, I just have enjoyed hearing about all of your thoughts on it as well. Um, I think that the motivation behind it is really great, you know, building safe community around transportation. Um, but I also would really heavily encourage you to take that next step by um, striking the misdemeanor from the original language. I think that that is super, super important. Um, you know, getting around uh, accessing, you know, your place of work, groceries, other necessities should not ever be considered a crime that goes on your permanent record. Um, and also, in addition to that, Metro Transit says that, um, you know, they're no longer planning to charge fare evaders with the misdemeanor. So it doesn't make sense to not formalize it because you still leave that, op that avenue open and it just is, is a little illogical and it only creates more fear around the transit system. Um, and you're assuring safety in plenty of other ways that they don't think that this will address. 
um, I think about, you know, that fear specifically for me as a transit rider um, without decriminalizing uh, the transit Asian system is really, it seems like kind of unable to fulfill its purpose to its full extent and kind of serves as a second form of police without, you know, providing the, you know, without even providing the like potential protection that transit police are intended to provide. Um, and by removing the misdemeanor, they are going to be able to do their jobs as, as intended by this. And um, we'll all be just as safe as we were before. Thank you, Thank Ms. Montez. Uh, next to my testifier list, we have Finn McGarity. Ms. McGarity, I, please uh, state your name and uh, proceed with your testimony. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Newman and committee members. Uh, my name is Finn McGarity. I'm an organizer with Move Minnesota. And um, like Story said, uh, we also share uh, concerns around creating an administrative citation system. Uh, without decriminalizing fare evasion. We appreciate the good faith effort, but uh, this bill really does create the potential for two systems of justice where one rider could receive an administrative citation and another rider could find themselves with a misdemeanor. And I know um, respectfully, Senator Dibble, you said um, because of the low amount of prosecution um, that fares, uh, fare evasion uh, currently experiences that it's not necessarily a consequence, but even if folks aren't prosecuted, getting carried off the train in handcuffs, spending an afternoon in jail, that's a consequence. Um, furthermore, we have evidence to support this. For example, in New York, uh, officers have similar discretion to either issue a civil citation or make an arrest. And while we have seen arrests drop, we still do um, see a disparity in that enforcement with 89% of uh, Black and Latinx writers uh, comprising arrests. So while we appreciate, um, again, those good faith efforts to move towards an administrative um, citation program, we urge you to pass a complete solution and amend this bill to include decriminalization. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGarity. Uh, next to my testifier list, I have Mr. Joshua Hodet. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Newman. Um, my name is Joshua Hodak, and I'm a senior program manager with the Sierra Club Minnesota North Star chapter with 80,000 members and supporters across the state. I'm also speaking as a person who, previous to the pandemic, uh, uses both bus and rail transit regular track. Forgive the pun, there's a lot when talking about transportation. It's on the right track. Uh, to more fairly and equitably enforce transit fare non-payment. It's also, we believe, well overdue uh, to making riding transit more accessible and equitable for, for everyone. But not paying a $2 or a $2.50 fare, like uh, uh, Chair Newman mentioned earlier, should, uh, we believe, be equivalent to not feeding a parking meter. This should not be a criminal act. Uh, however, the bill, while, while intentioned and heading in the right direction, does uh, raise some concerns for us as well. The fair enforcement uh, reform must not set up two systems where a person can be penalized by either an administrative citation or a misdemeanor uh, uh, offense, criminal offense. So as we're experiencing just this week with the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin, we need more standardization of enforcement, not multiple systems. We strongly support a common sense and tested system of utilizing well-trained and resourced, uh, we're calling them uniform transit safety officials or transit ambassadors, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, but we know this is working in other cities. Other cities are trying it and, and, it, and it's working. Uh, in my mind, the idea, ideal personnel equipped for, for this position is a mashup of, uh, as, as uh, we heard earlier, the classic old train conductor with uh, a social worker who is experienced and trained in de-escalation, conflict resolution and social services, but not a heavily armed police officer. Transit should be, must be safe and accessible for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodick. Um, at this time, I'll go to member questions. 
Anyone having questions on this bill? Mr. Chairman? Uh, Senator Newman. Uh, uh, I just got word that uh, Mr. Shetnam uh, would like to comment. <clears throat> you could uh, um, allow him to do that. I, I was just passed the note, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Thank you, Senator Newman. I'll have to decide if I want to know this. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Shetnam, go ahead. Uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciate you uh, giving me a couple minutes here, and I want to start out by uh, saying thank you to Senator Dibble and to Senator Newman uh, for your work on this bill. Um, I appreciate the fact that we've come uh, a long way from where we were on this last year, and I'd also like to thank the committee members for that as well, because it appears like we are making some good progress on this. I um, I will, however, state that we do have a departure in a couple areas uh, from where this amendment is going, but I also want to let you know that we're happy to continue to work with you on this. Uh, I think it's important for, for me to share that the, the council is not proposing to have the counties um, fund this. Uh, we are proposing to fund it with at least the first couple of years out of our uh, federal relief funds that we've um, received. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that it was clear that the council uh, has a different approach related to the, um, to the funding of this program as well. Um, I do believe that there is room for us to work together and, uh, and I hear a lot of the comments that are being made by the um, uh, advocates for this as well. And, uh, and so the only thing I wanted to make sure that people were aware of is that I appreciate that the, um, the Senate has come a long way in this and that we look forward to uh, working with you and, and the House so we can hopefully pass uh, something that we believe will be uh, kind of transformational in how uh, people use our transit system, how they feel comfortable in our transit system, and uh, get a broad variety of benefits from having um, this new approach to um, to fare evasion, but also a new approach to how uh, we are welcoming people to our system. So uh, thank you for giving me that uh, that short amount of time to make that case. So thank or make that point. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shetman. Uh, with that, members, we'll go to member questions. Anyone having questions? Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a question just uh, to clarify in my mind here uh, on uh, the uh, the A7 amendment on page seven. Uh, there is some coverage of uh, the banning uh, banning abuse mandatory bans and uh, referencing gross misdemeanor and felony violations committed uh, in a facility or in a vehicle. Is that new? And I see that that's being added to the uh, language here. Is that new or is it replacing something else that has uh, appeared somewhere else? Thanks, sir. Senator Newman or Senator Dibble want to respond to that or maybe uh, Ms. Stengel? I, I think maybe Ms. Stengel would probably be the best re response. Okay, Ms. Stengel. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair, hit the wrong button. Um, the, uh, the section that Senator Carlson references in the A7 amendment um, is new in the amendment. There wasn't um, a similar provision in the earlier bill. However, I will say this concept has been in the previous bills uh, that have been before the committee maybe in past years, so it may look familiar, but it wasn't in the underlying bill. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Uh, Senator Dibble. It was, it was in the previous amendment um, that had been suggested or offered and withdrawn by Senator Newman at the previous hearing. Thank you, Senator. Senator Carlson, follow-up? Uh, yes, uh, and so what this covers is any of those kinds of crimes in any transit vehicle or facility. So that means that uh, uh, bus stops, bus stations as well. And I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about the safety of, uh, of riders that uh, may be waiting for uh, transportation here. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, this covers anyone who might be uh, you know, purse snatching, anything like that, that uh, they're doing some uh, maybe uh, petty crimes in, uh, uh, to people who are waiting for transit. I guess that's that's just what I'm wondering if that is the intent here of this section. Senator Dibble or Senator Newman? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the answer to uh, Mr. Car or Senator Carlson's question is yes, that, that is what the intent is. 
Thank you, Senator Newman. Thank you, Senator. Further questions? I'm going to skate. Seeing none, uh, Senator Dimble, any closing comments? Uh, no, no, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I think I'm heading to judiciary, but I need confirmation of that. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. Yes, you are. <laughs> so I would move uh, Senate File 1513 be recommended to pass as amended and referred to the committee on whatever we call judiciary. <laughs> thank you. Senator uh, Dibble moves Senate File 1513 as amended, uh, pass and be re referred to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, if you could turn your microphones on and all those in favor say aye and raise your thumb. Aye. 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 Those opposed say no and a thumbs down. No. No. Um, motion carries and the bill will be referred to Judiciary Committee. Senator Newman, I'll turn the gavel back to you for any possible announcements. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, that does complete our uh, agenda for this afternoon. I don't have any further uh, announcements, so we'll see you next Tuesday, and we'll take up the budget bills. Uh, with that, members, we are adjourned.